The 1920s brought Boise its share of the prosperity, culture, and commerce that gave new life to the rest of America. The urban center, invigorated by a booming economy, innovative technology, and progressive thinking, was sheltered from many of the hardships that most rural areas suffered during the time. In fact, Boise flourished in the Roaring Twenties, the age of ascendancy not only in the massive strides in air travel and other technologies, but also in the sphere of consumer culture. From the bustling car industry, to the monumental success of local theaters, to the perceived moral high ground of prohibition, the City of Trees found itself ready to grow, prosper, and celebrate. Despite national post-war economic difficulties, Boise remained stable, even experiencing major leaps in transportation infrastructure. The Boise Train Depot, as it is known today, was one example of this prosperity. After years of efforts and persuading by local capitalists and business leaders, the Union Pacific Railroad finally began construction in 1924 on a main line not far from Boise's original depot. The Mission Revival-style station sat atop the Grand Plateau known as the Bench, overlooking downtown, the State House, and the Old Oregon Trail, soon becoming the lifeblood of local transportation for goods and people, as well as a landmark which Boise is still known by today. Its large, long walls with unadorned surfaces, wide, projecting eaves, and a low-pitched terracotta roof are all characteristic of the Spanish Mission Revival style, an architectural movement that began in the late 19th century and drew inspiration from the early Spanish missions in California. Exterior walls were coated with stucco to shield the bricks beneath, sporting long, arcaded corridors, pointed arches, and curved gables. The station, along with many other structures built in the 20s, reflects the impulse of architects to show internationalism in their buildings. The vibrant architecture of the depot gave travelers from the east a first taste of Western architecture, and Westerners a reminder of what the past left behind. On April 16, 1925, the first train steamed into the new station surrounded by cheering crowds. The depot served many years as the entrance point for Boise in an age when cars were not yet dominant. Eventually phased out by the building of the interstate and the increase in the use of automobiles, the depot sent off its last Amtrak in May of 1997. Today, Big Mike, a steam locomotive built in 1920, resides on the east side of the depot as a relic of the railroad. The depot, with its extraordinary view of downtown and Capitol Boulevard, is not only a public museum of Idaho transportation, but also a landmark upon the east bench of Boise that displays the city's collective history as a somewhat isolated yet metropolitan area in America. In 1926, only one year after Boise's mainline celebration, the city inaugurated private airmail delivery service in the United States. For the first time in American history, airmail would be delivered by a commercial entity instead of the military. On April 6th, Varney Airlines, originally based in Boise, saw their pilot Leon Cudback land the first load of mail at the new airport, which was located in a field near the Boise River, what is now the campus of Boise State University. Varney Airlines merged with several others in 1928 to create United Airlines. United Airlines, the largest airline in the world today, claims April 6, 1926 as the anniversary of its founding and Boise as the founding place. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh, prized American aviator and icon of the 20s, was met by roaring crowds when he stopped at the Boise Airport during the national tour that followed his famous trip across the Atlantic. His flight proved to be an unprecedented symbol of the progress that adorned the era. In addition to leaps in transportation, the technological glory of the 20s pronounced itself in unexpected places amplifying usual entertainment and luxury activities to a nuanced, extraordinary level. In 1929, the McCann Fe offered Boiseans a unique opportunity to experience an advanced system for dining out. The restaurant was advertised as being 100% waiterless, an all-you-can-eat buffet-style eatery that used conveyor belts to bring the food around the restaurant. Because of this, customers at the McCann Fe had no need to get up from their seats. The food traveled directly to them. There was a system of three belts. The top belt carried desserts, the middle belt carried main courses, fish, chicken, or even steak, and the lowest belt took the finished dishes and returned them to the kitchen. The initially cheap entrance fee of only 25 cents was undoubtedly part of what earned the cafe its beloved reputation, but also its eventual demise in the 40s due to wartime rationing. 
The prosperity of the 1920s also manifested itself in education as well as entertainment. Boise High School saw renovation and additions to its campus during the decade, including the removal of the red brick building during the summer of 1921, which was replaced by the central wing, complete with a bust of Plato carved into the upper facade. This Greek detail, along with countless other features, such as the white pillars looming before the main entrance, symbolizes the school's national scholastic reputation and commitment to academics. In 1923, a radio tower was added to the roof of the school to transmit Idaho's first radio station. The station, KFAW, broadcasted from the basement of the East Wing in the Physics Department. In 1928, the station was sold to investors and changed to KIDO Radio. A number of theaters grew in popularity during the 20s, including the Pinney Theater. Opened in 1908 and built across Jefferson Street from Mayor James Pinney's old Columbia Theater, it showed films and other performances to the viewers who filled the thousand seats within its ornate walls. The Pinney shared the title of one of the best movie houses in Boise, along with the iconic Egyptian Theater. The Egyptian was designed by the Boise architect Frederick C. Hummel, who had joined his father's firm, Tortolat and Hummel. The building was commissioned by Leonard Falk, a prominent figure in Boise and owner of Falk's ID department store. Hummel wished to design the theater in the Spanish revival style, but Falk insisted on a popular Egyptian theme that had become a trend across the nation after the discovery of King Tut's tomb. The gilded detailing of the walls and the interior and exterior arches show that Falk got what he wanted, but the terracotta roof is a detail showing Hummel's original desires. The Egyptian opened on April 19, 1927, with a showing of Don Juan, starring John Barrymore and Mary Astor. Over the years, the theater changed hands several times, and was known by other names, including The Fox and The Ada. Like many movie palaces, as the audiences grew smaller, the future of the building was in jeopardy. In the 1970s, when the owner planned to auction off the theater organ, a relic of the silent film era in order to raise money to maintain the building, a group of Boiseans, led by architects Ron Thurber and Charles Hummel, son of Frederick Hummel, formed a committee to buy the organ. The group planned a showing of the classic silent film Wings, with the organ providing the musical accompaniment. A vintage World War I airplane was suspended over the intersection of Capitol Boulevard and Main Street to advertise the event. The night of the final showing saw a packed theater, and a movement to preserve the building was initiated. The Egyptian was saved and purchased by preservationist Earl Hardy, who refurbished it. In 1999, when ownership of the theater passed to his daughter, Anita K. Hardy, and her husband, architect Gregory Caslow, the building underwent a complete restoration. The Egyptian theater, aside from being a past and present community treasure, provided a cleaner alternative to the nightlife that is so intertwined with the nostalgia of the 20s. The loose morals of speakeasies, big band jazz, and flapper girls. The partying associated with the decade could not be repressed in Boise, despite some local efforts remaining quite apparent in buildings like the Riverside Pavilion built in 1927. The building that we now know as the Mardi Gras Ballroom features a Spanish mission architecture style with arches, a flat roof, and concrete, stucco, and adobe materials. According to the ballroom's own history, it is rumored that a circus passing through Boise lent their elephants to aid in the construction of the roof in the late 20s. It was originally an open-air pavilion where various events were held, usually jazz concerts, dances, parties, and vaudeville. Like many other affluent consumers of the era, Leonard Falk displayed his part of the era's wealth by constructing stylish homes and grand venues like department stores, an icon of the American 1920s. In 1923, Falk commissioned an $18,000 mansion to be built on the coveted Warm Springs Avenue, a home worth 10 times the cost of the average home in Boise. A combination of old Spanish and Italian architecture, with an emphasis on Mediterranean revival, the house is surrounded by a lavish pool with an artistic water feature and an expansive garden. It was designed by notable architect K.K. Cutter, whose work was incredibly diverse and catered to the international styles of the age, such as Tudor and arts and craft. Cutter also designed the English half-timbered home of C.C. C. Anderson, who, like Falk, 
owned a department store, the Golden Rule Chain. As Boise expanded east along Warm Springs Boulevard and north along Harrison Boulevard, the two streets were dotted with new construction featuring these grand international styles that continue to add character to the city. A less opulent but nonetheless famous landmark also built on Warm Springs exists now as the Trolley House Restaurant. A hidden gem, the square, red brick exterior downplays the artistry of the detailed roof and the lead glass crafted windows. The building was originally a trolley dispatch station, providing easier access to the natatorium, a swimming pool next door heated with geothermal water. According to the owner, rumor has it that the trolley house served a more secretive purpose as well. A speakeasy was supposedly located below the building during Prohibition, which ran high-stakes gambling and was complete with escape tunnels running under Warm Springs as an extra precaution. The trolley lines ended in 1928, replaced by gas-powered buses, but Boise's Trolley House remains a quaint, inconspicuous restaurant that embraces its eventful past. The contrast between Falk's mansion and eclectic joints like the Trolley House symbolized the diversity of life in the 1920s. International style fads were sweeping through the city, seen in homes, as well as public buildings like the Egyptian and the Depot. These trends would stay popular for some time. The Hotel Boise, an Art Deco building designed by Frank Hummel, would be completed in 1930 as Idaho's first skyscraper, preceding a series of similarly styled buildings that would continue to pop up through the 30s. At the same time as the construction of these grand statement structures that symbolized the prosperity of the 20s, lively buildings like the McKenna Fay and the Riverside Pavilion revealed the fun, innovative side of the decade. As Boiseans of the Jazz Age partied the night away, lost themselves in the stories told on the silver screen of grand theaters, and marveled at the wonders of air travel, they celebrated the affluence and life of the era. Through the decade, Boise built new homes, venues, and culture, letting the city of trees stand out like an urban spotlight against the rural west.